Hello and welcome to Psych3020 and our very first online uh, tutorial video lecture and uh, with these lectures we've got the option just to uh, watch the video like you're doing now or if you can't stand the sound of my uh, voice you can just download uh, the PDF of the slides where I've designed the slides to be uh, pretty much uh, self-contained so if you just prefer to read those you can uh, however you can just, just sit back and let me talk you through these uh, slides right now uh, but of course remember it's a video so uh, you've got the option of rewinding if you want to hear something again or of course fast forwarding if I'm boring you. In measurement we use a lot of statistical uh, techniques such as uh, correlations uh, to test the validity and reliability of our measures so in principle you should already know everything there is to know about uh, correlations but appreciate that in practice uh, you've probably been taught this in first year and have uh, completely forgotten it or you just managed to wing it the first time round and you never really got it hopefully this lecture will give you a refresher of all of these basics that you uh, need to know and of course all of this information will be tested in the online tutorial quizzes you'll be doing uh, and will be tested in the final exam so here we go Correlations is what we're going to cover today, and they're widely used uh, over a whole uh, for all sorts of techniques uh, in human measurement. Okay, so specifically things like t determining uh, reliability and the validity of uh, tests. Okay, and if you can remember, a correlation is simply uh, a measure of relationship. Okay, how strongly related are two variables. Uh, the correlation itself uh, is usually denoted by a number and that number can be anywhere from uh, minus one to plus one. So plus one is our perfect relationship so this is where one of the variables increases the other one also increases. A zero correlation is where the two variables have no relationship no association with one another whatsoever and a minus one correlation is a perfect inverse relationship so that is as one variable goes up the other one goes down so the actual number itself is the correlation coefficient and uh, you can think of that as just a, a descriptive statistic like a mean where it's telling you the strength and the direction of the relationship so in terms of conceptualizing exactly what a correlation is, what it actually means, a best way of conceptualizing it is to think of a scatter plot, uh, like the one I'm going to show you right here. I've chosen a really concrete example of uh, two variables, head circumference and arm length. Each uh, dot on this scatter plot is one person, so in pretty much everything we do in uh, psychology when we're looking at correlations, uh, the dots on the scatter plots are people. There's our first person up there, and uh, what can we say about this first person? Well, he's got a pretty big head, and he's got pretty long arms. And there you go, I've got very long arms and a huge head. Here's a person where, yeah, they're still fairly big, but they're not as big as uh, Captain Giant at the top there. So he's got a fairly biggish head, uh, head and longish arms. Okay, now we're down to someone who's closer to the middle of the scale, so they've more got medium sized arms, medium sized head. Okay, oh, we're getting on to the little people now. These guys have got, uh, yes, arms a bit on the short side, head a little bit on the small side. And finally, right down the bottom here, we have uh, our hobbit, who's got a tiny little head and little, little arms. And notice that all those guys fall on uh, this diagonal, more or less, not perfectly, but more or less. And that basically tells us that there's a very strong correlation between head circumference and arm length. That is, the bigger your head, the longer your arms are likely to be, if we can generalize this data. That means those two variables are not independent. Uh, if I know roughly what your head size is, I'll probably be able to come up with a pretty accurate guess of what your arm length will be. Of course, in the real world, there'll be a small number of people with really, really, really short arms and huge heads. Okay, and maybe some other uh, freaky people with arms so long that their knuckles are like dragging on the ground, but tiny, tiny pinheads. 
So there's a small number of uh, outliers like that out there, but most people fall roughly on this diagonal. I'm going to show you now an example from human measurement to illustrate the different uh, strengths of uh, correlations. So imagine that uh, you've done this course, you've got your qualification, and you're now a human measurement expert. So imagine you've been contracted by someone to create a test to measure, say, electrician ability. And there's our electrician. And in this test, what you've done is set up a room with a whole bunch of uh, simulated tasks in. Okay, so that, that is, they might have a, might be a bench in there where they have to go in, they have to wire a plug, they have to f sort of fix a whole bunch of junction boxes, have to do a whole load of wiring. And for each of those tasks, you time how long they take to do it. When they finished it, you come up with a, a rating of what the quality of their work actually is. And the idea is we, have, we need a big enough range of tasks with a good range of levels of difficulty that represent all the sorts of things we expect a good electrician to do. And imagine we get them through all of these tasks and then we calculate an overall score out of 100, taking into account their quality of their work and their speed and aggregate all of that together and it gives us one score out of 100 which tells us how good they are at plumbing. Or at least that's what we're hoping for because of course we need to test that idea by seeing if this battery of tests we've created is actually valid. If you had a test like this what could you use it for? Well first of all you could use it for a selection tool so if you're hiring electricians if you're a big company, you've got to hire 100 electricians. You have hundreds and hundreds of uh, applicants. Which ones will you hire? Well, you can just get them all to do this test. Hire the ones who get the highest scores. If you're, say, a self-employed electrician, you want to advertise to customers and you want to show them how good you are, then maybe you do this test and then show them some certificate where you can say, ah, I'm a 93 out of 100 electrician. I'm absolutely fantastic. And that means uh, I'm going to charge you more than uh, this crappy electrician who's sitting next to me who only scored. 23 out of 100. Also if you're a trainee electrician you've got to choose which electrician course to go on. Maybe these sorts of evaluations would be useful for actually evaluating the training courses. So you might have two training courses to choose between. You look at the stats and you can see that one training course improves the score in this test by 50 points. The other one only improves it by 20 points. Let's choose the one that improves it by 50 points. So we've created the test but we don't yet know whether it's doing what we think it's doing, as in, is it really measuring how good an electrician they are? Okay, so how do we go about testing the validity of this test, whether it measures what we think we're measuring? First thing we do, we recruit lots of electricians, and importantly, as I'll discuss later, they've, it's got to be a very wide range of abilities, all the way from apprentices, all the way up to uh, real international level expert uh, electricians. Second thing we do is get them all to do our test. So that is we end up with a score out of 100 for each person. And then the third thing we do is that we let them loose into the real world and we get uh, some expert electrician, some sort of senior instructor, basically follows them around on a whole bunch of real jobs and comes up with a rating for that actual job performance. So essentially for each person we've got two numbers. First of all we've got the number that they came out with when they did the test. And then secondly, we've got the rating of how they're performing in the real world. And our test of validity is simply going to be, does the test correlate, correlate with real job performance? So the correlation between test performance and job performance, that will be our validity coefficient for the test. How It's going to be a measure, one bit of evidence to indicate whether our test is valid or not where the higher the correlation, the more valid the test is. Okay, so let's look at a few possible outcomes we might get. This is our perfect ideal world that of course never happens in real life, but we would really like it to. So if we can draw a single straight line through all of our electricians, uh, then we get a perfect correlation. Okay, so here's our scatter plot. Here's job performance up the vertical axis. Here's test scored on the horizontal axis. And all of these dots here are individual electricians. So up here we've probably got our expert electricians who are getting high test scores. And those high test scores are correctly predicting that their job performance is really good. Down the bottom end we've got our useless no-hopers where they've just gone into the test. They perform really badly at all the tests. They've screwed things up. They've got everything wrong. And as predicted they go into the real world and electrocute themselves. So there you go, person at the top, I got a high test score and turned out to be superb at the job, 
person at the bottom, don't know why they're smiling, because they got the lowest test score and they turned out to be utterly crap. This is brilliant because it means that if we know someone's test scores, we can predict what their job performance will be with 100% accuracy. Of course, this assumes that the job performance rating is it in itself accurate, but I'll leave that for something we'll discuss in the lectures further. But anyway, this state of affairs is amazing. Let's look at something less amazing but more realistic. So this one here I'd be pretty happy with. So this is a situation where we haven't got that perfect diagonal line, but we've still got a pretty high correlation. What we've got is a bigger spread of scores around that best fit uh, uh, around that best fit, that uh, diagonal line. So this correlation here would be about a correlation of about 0.8. So not perfect, but still pretty good in that test score is still pretty, providing a relatively accurate measure of job performance. Okay, sexy. This person there, they've got a medium test score and rated a bit below average at the job, but still, it's not a million miles out. Okay, so in this case, if we use this test, as they substitute for job performance to decide whether to hire people. It wouldn't be perfect uh, in this case, but it'd be certainly better than chance. It's pretty, pretty certainly in the right ballpark. Okay, we wouldn't make any really bad errors. Now we're getting into the realms where, ah, it's still okay. Uh, we've, we're still getting something that's worth probably worth doing, but it's uh, getting less impressive now. So this correlation here would be about a 0.4 correlation. Okay, so we can still see there's a clear diagonal relationship there so generally higher test scores are related to job performance but there's a lot more noise in the data so test score is now a much more inaccurate predictor of job performance so you can see here there's a couple of people who are outliers this person out here where they actually turned out to be very good at the job but they've only got an average test score um, but even with all of this it's not brilliant but we're still, even in this case, we're still avoiding hiring the very worst people so that is, there's nobody in these top left or bottom right quadrants, right on the very edges here, where they're getting a very high score and a low job performance rating. Okay, so we're still weeding out the really worst people. This is disaster. Okay, this is if the correlation between job performance and test score is zero. That This means that test score gives you no prediction of what the job performance will be. It gives you no information. Those two variables are completely independent. So, because you can see, you've got people here in every single quadrant of the scatter plot. People are at the top there, very low test score, but uh, he's actually the best at the job. And there's a person down here who's getting an excellent test score, but they're useless at the job. So, what this is saying is our test is a complete worthless load of rubbish. Nightmare scenario. Test is a complete waste of time. No, val no validity whatsoever. So, might as well flip a coin. So let's talk about the uh, magnitude of the correlation coefficient. So basically, the bigger the number, the stronger the relationship, but that can be in either direction. Uh, but the magnitude is entirely dependent on how much uh, scatter there is in that relationship. Noise in the relationship is the other way of say saying it. The closer people are to that perfect diagonal, the stronger the relationship. So uh, the other thing we need to bear in mind is the direction. So it can be positive or negative. So here's a positive one. As the measure goes up, the other one also goes up. Here's a negative relationship. As one goes up, the other one goes down. If I saw this in the context of this particular example, the uh, first thing I would assume is that uh, I'd uh, screwed up the test scoring. I'd actually got things something the wrong way around because it's, it's being predictive. It is predicting job performance. It's just predicting it back to front. So in some ways, this isn't so much of a disaster as the no validity one, uh, simply in the fact that we can fix that by just multiplying all the score, everything by minus one, and that would, uh, reversing the entire rank order, and then that actually would give us quite a good prediction. Okay, but obviously, as it stands, it's bad, because uh, if we used it just as it was without fixing that, uh, then that, of course, would be a disaster because we'd hire the worst people and uh, not hire the best people. And here's some examples of some uh, real scatter plots. So things to note here, look at this top line here where you can see uh, we've got the different correlation coefficients and the scatter plots that are associated with them. And you can see that the magnitude of that correlation is entirely dependent on how scattered the dots are. If you look at this second line where we've got different slopes, Okay, but the level of scatter is exactly the same, uh, as in there's no scatter in all of them. Uh, you can see that even this one where it's a shallow slope, 
that's still a correlation of one. And the reason for that is that correlations basically involve standardizing both variables. So they essentially both turn into Z scores. And that means that correlations are completely independent of the scales you're using. So it doesn't matter that, see, this particular scale is only quite small in the vertical direction, and yet the horizontal scale is quite wide. That's irrelevant because we've standardized both scales. The critical thing is the amount of scatter. There's virtually no scatter there, so that still counts as a correlation of one. It's only when it gets completely horizontal uh, that that becomes a correlation of uh, zero. Well, uh, well, in fact, it becomes something where you can't even calculate a correlation because there's literally no variability whatsoever in that uh, the vertical variable. All right, if we look at the bottom line here, this basically makes the point that correlations are only testing for linear relationships, that is, a straight line relationship like you can see there. You can get all sorts of other relationships like this up and down one here where there's, there's obviously there is a relationship there, it's just not a linear one and a correlation is simply not testing for that. So if you literally put in that one there, you'd get a correlation of zero. That would be a miss, you'd assume that, ah, oh, that means there's no relationship between the two variables, but you'd be wrong because there's look, it's this wibbly wavy, curvy type relationship that we simply would just need a different type of statistic to detect. So to pick up on one point I raised there, which is that uh, one thing's absolutely critical to coming up with correlations is variation in score. And the reason for that is that with a correlation, the variation is literally all the correlation is measuring. The variation is everything. That means if you don't have any decent variability in the first place in either of your variables, you just can't work out, well, you can't work out correlation or the correlation will be massively underrepresented. So that is, correlations are all about how people score relative to one another. We don't care about the uh, original absolute scale. So, for example, when you're designing your test, so for example, in assignment two, you're going to be designing some personality measures. When you come up with your items, one of the fundamental things you've got to bear in mind is that you need to design questions where some people are going to score at one end of the scale, some people are going to score at the other end of the scale, and some people are going to score in the middle. That is, you want to spread across all of the numbers. If you create a question where everybody's just scoring right down at one end of the scale, so that is, there's very little variation in the scores, that's no use to you in that context. That means that any correlation you're going to look at is going to be very, very small and or possibly even uninterpretable. So, bottom line is this, if you're creating a measure that you plan to use correlations on, you've got to design it to give you a decent spread of scores. In addition to designing your instrument to give you a good spread of scores, when you actually test it out on a sample of people, you also need to make sure the sample of people are likely to give you a decent range of scores. Let's give you an example of what I mean by that. So, first of all, the spread is truncated in any way, so we call this a restriction of range, and this means that the a correlation magnitude may be reduced. Okay, so that is <coughs> might give you a false impression that the underlying relationship, the true, for example, validity of the test, is less than what it actually is. And to give it extreme, if everyone scores exactly the same in any measure, then the correlation will literally be meaningless. For the electrician example, two things you've got to bear in mind. First of all, when you create the tasks in the first place, you've got to make sure that they're of appropriate, uh, an appropriate level of difficulty so that some people can do them, some people can't do them or that you, you actually end up with a decent range of quality uh, qualities of work, as it were, at the end. <coughs> uh, and the whole point is you're trying to create tasks so you can tell apart uh, electricians of different levels second thing you need to do is when you test this you need to recruit participants with an appropriate spread of skills so that you can test both ends of your scale, uh, scale. you can get a good uh, spread of scores and that will allow you to uh, come, up with, come up with decent correlations which will allow you to assess the validity and assess the validity and the reliability of your test.